Alex Navarro, it is not Monday or Friday. No, it is not. I, but I had just called you because I want to know. I have a I have a big question to ask you. Yes. What is that question? What is a core gamer? Uh, a gamer that spends a lot of time like working on like kind of the middle section of their body, mm. kind of to make sure you know that's that's the strongest part of them. I guess I don't. What kind I of games? What kind of games do you play to work on that? Is that like Dota? Like if you like at, you know like clicks per minute? Does that work? Does that work on your core? I, I don't know the answer to this question. I don't know. You're... All right. Ah, okay. All right. <laughs> I was gonna see how long I could string you out on that one, though. I yeah. feel like I feel like I took that as far as I could. In reality, uh, breaking news uh, yeah. out today is that Ken Levine made a uh, genuine surprise announcement. You know, no mm -hmm. rumblings leading up to this. No sort of indication that this was coming. But that uh, essentially, Irrational Games, as we know it, the developer of, you know, all the way from Freedom Force to uh, SWAT 4, yeah, SWAT 4. Uh, Bioshock, Bioshock Infinite, uh, and in a couple short weeks, the conclusion, I guess, maybe of the Bioshock universe with Burial at Sea um, Part 2 is closing. Uh, yeah. Ken Levine is shutting down Irrational Games as we know it, uh, seemingly you know, going to pick up a new name. Um, but he's taking 15 core members, whatever that means. We're, we're not really sure, but basically he's plucking 15 employees to start basically a new developer within Take-Two. Uh, yes. To start something completely different. We'll get into what he was talking about uh, a little bit uh, later. But he's taking 15 people to do that within the Take-Two structure. He's not leaving to form a new company outside of that. Um, and everyone else has been kind of told, hey, Figure out something else. So before we kind of break down exactly what else he, he mentioned in the letter, what is your sort of initial reaction to the, the news? It's, I mean, it's surprising for a number of reasons because, you know, generally you don't hear about studios like this closing down unless, you know, the last project they worked on was not particularly successful. Um, in the case of Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite, those are two very successful games that have, you know, generated, generated a lot of revenue for 2K um, so this isn't, you know, there are a lot of people that are already kind of reacting, I, I've seen on social media about like how this is just another, you know, death knell in the grand scheme of AAA game development, but this doesn't seem like that. This seems like a very hyper-specific situation for Irrational in the sense that in the way Ken Levine laid it out in his message on the Irrational website, he is doing this because he wants to take a different creative direction. He wants to kind of revamp like what a development team under him would look like. Uh, and it has seemingly very little to do with the actual success of the studio. Um, that doesn't make it any less bitter pill to swallow for the people who are now, you know, suddenly out of a job because Ken Levine decided to, I mean, I, I don't necessarily want to call this taking his ball and going home, but I don't know how else to describe this because you're essentially shutting down a studio of what was, at least as of 2012, 200 people for the sake of taking your 15 favorites and going and making a new thing and kind of leaving everyone else in the lurch. In another situation, this might be a situation where another person would come in and run that studio to work on other things, but in this case, it doesn't sound like they're actually going to do that. They're just going to dissolve irrational as we know it. Yeah, I mean, I think... You know, without having really any reporting on this myself, we are reacting purely to the news that has has come out. Um, so I can't speak any further than what we know and, and from what's been publicized. But you would think this is essentially take two communicating. Uh, if we're to take it at face value, that their chief interest in irrational games was Ken Levine. Right. And if they had a real interest in seeing what that studio did with a number two or a number three, if if someone like that existed in that studio, right? Uh, they're not willing to take that chance, or don't think that that studio is going to make a lot of sense uh, for what Take Two's ambitions are. You know, this is a company that you know publishes Grand Theft Auto games. They have large ambitions for uh, how their games are supposed to sell uh, and do in the market. Uh, and essentially, I don't know if it's la a a lack of a vote of confidence in the rest of the studio, or more that, look, from the very beginning, this was all about Ken Levine. And when Ken Levine, you know, approached Take-Two to say, hey, uh, I'd like to go do something else, Take-Two's response was, well, why don't you do that here, and we'll give you what you want to kind of do, you know, sort of a startup incubator project 
uh, within the Take Two structure itself. Yeah, and you know, I it, it there's no mistaking that you know Irrational has been all about Ken Levine pretty much since the Bioshock era. Like he's the 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 face that they have trotted out to talk about that franchise. I mean, he's been the creative lead, you know, and. While there have been many other writers and designers and developers that have worked on that franchise and its various incarnations over the years, uh, especially during the Bioshock Infinite development, where it sounds like there was at least you know a decent amount of turnover uh, as that went through its paces, Ken Levine has been the guy that they have propped up as being the Artur of that series, the, the 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 creative mind behind it, the guy that you know is is responsible for Bioshock being what it is. And whether that's, you know, 100% true or not, I have no idea, but that's the way 2K has always framed it. So I can understand maybe why they would have a hard time thinking, well, does the rest of Irrational really matter if, you know, we're going to retain Levine and, you know, his hand-picked, uh, you know, team to work on this this crazy new thing that he wants to do. It just, you know, that still is kind of horrible, especially when you consider the the kind of downturns that have been going on in the Boston game dis, game dev scene in, in like recent years. You know, the the thirty eight studios debacle, Turbine just had layoffs, other like smaller shops that have belonged to larger publishers have gotten shut down. So now here's another like, let's just say ballpark and saying at least a hundred people that are probably out of work. Mm-hmm. And that that's fucking horrible, man. Yeah, you know, I, you know, we're you know already seeing what happens in a lot of these situations, which is after uh, a real mass closing, uh, there's definitely a uh, sort of coming together of the industry to, uh, you know, retweet and document uh, where there are potential uh, openings for the folks that are losing their job and maybe don't have uh, something quite lined up. Um, Sean Elliott, who's the former uh, games writer, journalist, critic, uh, who has been at Irrational for a number of years now, uh, his brief tweet was simply, uh, I need a job, which uh, sort of suggests that maybe this was sudden news to everyone else as well and not something that, uh, you know, has been stewing for a couple of weeks and now is the time to disclose it to the public because otherwise people are going to start finding out about it otherwise. Uh, it yeah. seems like the, the way to make this as a surprise is that, uh, you know, this is kind of how mass layoffs happen, uh, in which uh, the employees are quietly told in the morning, and then a, f- a couple hours later a public statement is made uh, while everyone is sort of busy processing everything that's happening. Don't know if yeah. that's exactly what happened, but it does appear uh, that there is, is something perhaps along those lines happening uh, right now, given that it doesn't seem like uh, folks have necessarily lined something up. Yeah. Um, but uh, let's, let's talk a little bit more about what he actually said. Sure. Uh, so the... I'm trying to find the actual statement. So I've he says, right what's, yeah, what's next? In time, we'll announce a new endeavor with a new goal, to make narrative-driven games for the core gamer that are highly replayable, to foster the most direct relationship with our fans possible, who we'll focus exclusively on content delivered digitally. Um, if you... Look at that first line uh, about uh, narrative-driven games for the core gamer that are highly replayable. Uh, There was an interview he did with uh, Brian Crescente of Polygon a couple of months back. It might be a a little bit longer than that. uh, Mm -hmm. In which he talked about this very concept of trying to find a way to make narratively-driven games um, that have more to them. Uh, you know, he uses the term replayable here. I'd have to go and see the actual language he used in that interview. But he seemed to be acknowledging sort of one of the problems in the design DNA of the games he makes, which is that he makes, uh, you know, highly scripted single-player big-budget adventures. You know, you have some agency in the combat. But uh, besides the combat scenarios, you know, when you're going to play it the second time, you're just going to A to B to C all over again. And it seems like You know, that's very expensive. It takes a long time to build. Um, And he seems to maybe try... Trying to want to look at that and see if there is a way to maybe have your cake and eat it too. To have the narrative uh, experience and drive that people seem to really like about his games. uh, But to do so in a way that isn't sort of one and done. And the solution to that uh, often in the past has been to, you know, add multiplayer. Like, there's another reason to hold on to the disc. And he seems to be trying to potentially uh, look at solving that problem, if it is a problem, uh, from another angle. Are you there? Alex, you disappeared. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? (laughs) 
<laughs> I don't know what happened. I'm not sure what happened to Alex Navarro. I, I, I think maybe Google is melting. Oh, Alex Navarro dropped out of the call. Let's try and get him back here. Let's try and get Alex Navarro back in this call. We got him. Look at this. Invite. Anyway, so I, I think it's an interesting question, right? I, I, I think the idea that um, you spend tens of millions of dollars, uh, potentially over $100 million on a lot of these really big budget experiences, uh, then you sell them on one $60 disc. Uh, you know, you try and create high-quality DLC for them to hold on to that disc. You try and create multiplayer for them to hold on to that disc. It's sort of a, an inherent f uh, functional problem of AAA, right? Which is that you spend a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of years building uh, inherently one-and-done experiences. And then once you've created that one-and-done experience, how, how do you get someone to not sell that one-and-done experience and then to go on and buy a used version of that. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that go into that. There are a lot of problems that are are running into one another um, when, when we're talking about this issue. Um, let's see. Let's pull up. Um, looks like Alex just went straight up offline. He'll, he'll come back. We got plenty to talk about. If you got questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Uh, I'll try and address some of them uh, while we wait for uh, the wolf. Uh, to to find his way back into uh, into here. Uh, so go ahead and hit an ad to reply to me in the chat. We'll look at some of those. Um, seventeen years. That that's what he mentions that in his his note that he has been with the Rational for seventeen years. And it, it makes me realize that I've uh, I've really never played a whole lot of uh, what Irrational has produced. I've uh, obviously played Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite and um, I want to say I tried like the demo for Freedom Forest way back in the day, but I I never really gave those games uh, much of a shot. Um, I th I don't know lack of interest or or anything of that nature. I just I just never really played them. Um, and SWAT Four, I always forget that uh, they made that. Go ahead and send another invite to Alex. Um, so in the, in the letter itself, he actually uh, Ken Levine. Uh, makes you know other references to this idea of a replayable narrative, uh, which is the term that he uses. Um, and I want, like, I wonder what that means. Like, is replayable narrative, uh, you know, the trend that we see in DayZ, in Minecraft, uh, games that you know set up worlds, uh, set up uh, the ability for players to tell their own stories, uh, and so you're essentially constructing a tool set for the player to uh, engage with. But it's not actually saying like, hey, we've authored a story, why don't we tell you it? Um, which is a real tension in, in the way that sort of games work because in most stories... <laughs> Alex Navarro just texted me, sorry dude, my internet straight up died. Uh, let's go ahead and text him back. That's okay, Alex. Um, you could... We could... Um, I wonder if you can use, could use Google Hangout on your phone with Apple headphones. You could listen and talk. See if that's possible. Hmm. See, we'll see, we'll, we'll see, we'll see how this goes. Otherwise, I'll just keep talking. I'll keep answering your questions. I can do this myself. That's fine. Uh, but like I was saying, you have a lot of games these days. You're seeing a lot of these in the early access uh, games, games that have just sort of like uh, really fundamental mechanics built in. Uh, Rust uh, is another one that I have not tried, but uh, is something that I like to read a whole lot about. Eve Online is another one of those. It's it's where the developers spend a lot of time giving the players agency. And it's agency in a world to create their own authored narratives. And it's not even authored narratives. The narratives are emergent from the world and the gameplay. 
but then they can be codified as a narrative after the fact. You know, like when I wrote that big story about Eve Online a couple of weeks back, you know, that's something that was emergent, that's something that happened naturally as a result of what EVE Online sets up for its players, what it allows them to do. And then it becomes this incredibly interesting story that sounds, you know, the idea that someone forgot to pay a bill and then that uh, creates this domino effect that uh, results in a ton of crazy stuff happening in the world. That's something that easily could have been authored, but it's the reason we're so fascinated with EVE Online is because it wasn't authored, because it was dynamic. It's because the world allowed for something like that to happen. Uh, and you know, stuff like that isn't... Uh, oh, Alex Navarro is back. Alex Navarro, we're inviting you back to the chat. Hey, buddy! I'm back! Whoa! You gave me a severe and unexpected uh, test of my improv skills. How was that? It was good. I, I think I got like a, like, a, like a B. Like a B, B plus. Okay. I think I did pretty good. Apologies um, for that. My internet just straight up died for like 10 minutes, and then it was back. So I don't know what happened. Uh, so one of the things that I was talking to myself about mm -hmm. uh, was when I was considering the idea of replayable narrative, uh, yes. I think what he might be alluding to is the trend that we see in EVE Online, Rust, um, DayZ, you know, Minecraft, games that set up worlds and places for narratives to emerge as opposed to it being authored by, you know, you know, Ken Levine coming up with sure. you know, the tale of Booker and Elizabeth. Right. And that, you know, that certainly sounds interesting and I can understand why, you know, if you're talking about doing something that's radically different than the scope of what you've been making over the course of all these years at Irrational, you would want to try and shift that team down into something more lean, something more manageable, something that, you know, it's a lot easier to experiment when you're just working with a small handful of people versus, like, you know, a team of hundreds that all has to kind of be managed carefully. So I get that, and I think that sounds interesting. And, you know, I mean, I, if nothing else, I have, at the very least, uh, a respect for what Ken Levine aims toward in his narrative designs and what he, you know, tries to make, even if I don't think he's 100% successful all the time. So I'm obviously, you know, very curious about what he would, you know try and bring bring to bear in, in this new situation. I just, I don't know, man. It's like, it's really hard for me to kind of sit there and try and pontificate too much about, like, what he might be trying to work on amid this current situation. I mean, there's no good way to ever lay people off. And in this situation, mm -hmm. he is at the very least seems to be, you know, giving his his former, now former employees, you know, still access to the studio. He, they're, they're working to try and get those people jobs. But in the end... He's still laying off like a hundred some odd people, you know, for the sake of of starting this new project. And I just I can't get past that right now for some reason. I, I can't even sit there and try and think about what it is he's going to be doing long term, while this is still very immediate and fresh. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting question. If we you know try and separate ourselves from uh, this specific situation, but if you try and think of uh, and, and not knowing the specifics of the situation, you know, necessarily not necessarily commenting on what it's like to work with Ken Levine or to work right. at that studio. But if you think of the broader question of if you've made a bunch of successful games, these games that take four or five years, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, um, and you decide that you want to do something different, yeah, but that you deciding to do something different. No matter what you choose to do, whether it's you know to stay within your existing company and start something new, to leave to go on your own, to want to make a change in your personal life that results in, will inevitably result in uh, the layoffs or the firings. However, you want to contextualize this, it's right. hard to without really having a, a better sense of what motivated this beyond the the statement we read. Uh, that sounds that's not that sounds really tough. Uh, yeah. Knowing that if you wanted to get out of that situation. And if the studio is predicated on essentially Ken Levine and Ken Levine alone, um, you know that's that seems like a, a tough decision to make. Like that's a lot of weight on on one person's shoulders. That you know, again, not knowing the specifics of their situation, I wouldn't want to be able. I wouldn't want to be in that position. Yeah, and I'm not accusing him of making this decision lightly or frivolously or anything like that. Because again, like you said, I have no idea what his his thought process was behind all that stuff. But you know, the, the, the problem I have with this current scenario is that if I'm a game developer and in in theory, let's say that, you know, he gets beyond this, this current situation where he has 15 people working with him and he wants to, you know, grow the team a little bit, make it bigger, what is the, 
what, like what is the the benefit necessarily of going to work for Ken Levine now under this uh, you know this this notion that you know at any point he could just decide well this isn't really what I want to do anymore leaving a whole bunch of people in the lurch like it it I understand that he is you know a creative talent and there is merit in being associated with him but you know it, it, just perception wise it would be I, it would take some convincing for me to want to go work for him knowing that this is you know something that he is very much willing to do for the sake of, you know, his own particular vision. Yeah, and some folks in the chat, uh, we don't, there's no replies tab anymore, so I can't. <laughs> when yeah. I asked, when you were gone, I asked for questions from the chat, and I have no way to, I don't have any way to keep track of that. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll figure out the chat later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but some folks were asking, uh, you know, like, yeah, how does this impact, you know, the response to Ken Levine's games going forward? Um, you know, I think you can see a little of that. There's actually... Uh, a weird coincidence happening today. Uh, Lee Alexander had an interview with uh, Cliff Bozinski uh, that went up on Gamasutra today. Alex, I don't know if you had a chance to... I, I, I glanced at it. I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing yet. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I highly recommend folks go and check it out. Um, he touches on some what feels like very similar ideas that we're kind of seeing uh, explored here. You know, right. he talks about, you know, wanting to work with a smaller team that focuses on digital and focuses on community. Uh, I think even in, in the Irrational one, he talks about... Um, he talks yeah, about wanting to get in touch with his players, be more in interconnected with the people who are playing his games, that kind of stuff. Yeah, let me find the commode. Yeah, so... Community... Yeah, so there's this quote from this article uh, with Blazinski where he says, PC is where I'm going to wind up. That's where the community is. The trend will always be, that trend will always be the core. If I start a studio, I want a community manager there day one. I want weekly video or podcasts. I want tasks that's available on the subreddit. When my wife and I play Rust. Before we play, we check the subreddit. Whenever you get a little bored with the game, someone issues an update. I feel like a game developer again where I get to check out the build list. And, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if this is part of this larger trend of developers that have been in AAA development for a number of years are established, have names, have gotten tired of a lot of what goes along with making those games, uh, which is that they take longer to make, there are even more restrictions than there ever have been in terms of uh, creative latitude uh, mm -hmm. of what you want to make. Um, and then all the pressure that goes on, uh, you know, the the companies themselves to justify the cost from right. its development cost, its marketing cost, uh, wouldn't you like to get out of that and you know potentially get back to why you got into making games in the first place? And I'm not surprised that maybe we're seeing an increasing trend there, especially with business models, you know, trending towards giving developers opportunities to do that. Um, yeah. You know, early access and the Minecraft model, which is where that was born out of, are, are you know pristine examples of of where potentially developers can go uh, with some of that stuff. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, a, an admirable goal, and I think that, you know, as much as, uh, you know, you, you feel for the people who, who are losing their jobs in the situation, you can understand a, a motivation toward wanting to work lean and to be able to more effectively oversee a community, not just, you know, a development team, and I think that's that's a completely worthwhile enterprise. And like you said, it is something that seems to be trending upward more and more. Uh, I still maintain the notion that this seemingly has less to do with any real definitive trends in AAA gaming right now. This specific situation has less to do with that, and more it seems like, you know, I mean, again, it's not, it's not, this is not a result of, of Bioshock Infinite seemingly being too expensive or not being successful. I mean, it was an expensive game, but it seemingly made money. You know, it's not, it, this, is, this does not seem like a particular indictment on AAA game development. It seems more just that Ken Levine has a vision. He did not see that vision existing within the current framework of what he had, so he decided to make this change. Yeah, I'm trying to look up... Um, it's been a while since uh, Infinite came out, so I'm trying to see what uh, the it financials... Last March, right? Yeah, let's see. da 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 this is not going to be something I can just look at very briefly. If someone in the chat wants to point out uh, if, if there is a, a decent summation of that, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, I think you're right. Like, it's hard to know, and, like, there certainly could be backroom politics uh, involved yeah. in, in some of this. You know, maybe, you know, maybe he was told uh, that, you know, hey, you know, as much as we liked Bioshock Infinite and it did okay, you know, we're looking for bigger and better, um, and you can't have the same kind of overhead 
You know, Bioshock Infinite uh, famously had Rod Ferguson come in, who is known in the industry as a closer, yeah. um, uh, to come in and basically get that project into shape so it could ship um, and, you know, potentially make money. Right. And so, you know, it, you know, it's possible to, to think that maybe that uh, was an influence on the discussion of the next project. But, you know, it's, it's tough because this all, this all gets into really speculative territory that, yeah. you know, is sort of neither here nor there. Um, and, you know, I'm, you know, I, you feel, you know, for the, the folks that are losing their jobs. Uh, but, you know, if you want to spin that around, uh, you could also say that... <clears throat> If Ken Levine, uh, who seems to be one of the few stu- operating one of the few studi- studios that uh, is sort of what Ken Levine says goes uh, mm-hmm. in in the most uh, extreme sort of way, yeah. uh, there are all sorts of really talented folks uh, working at Irrational. That when you have moments like this, you end up, you know, if you think two or three years down the road, we're probably going to get ten studios that probably create a handful of really amazing games. Out of this, you know, that's what happened yeah. with EALA. That's how we got, you know, games like Skulls of the Shogun and uh, Bastion uh, was because of people just getting pushed out uh, of, uh, you know, the traditional AAA model. They didn't want to lose their jobs; they just sort of did. And then, you know, you have to figure out where you go from there. And I think there's reason to be hopeful in these scenarios that, uh, you know, the kinds of folks that were attracted to working with a creative like Ken Levine on a game like Bioshock Infinite. Uh, they probably have a lot to offer the industry uh, in smaller clusters. Yeah, and that's the hope. And I certainly hope that this definitely, you know, spawns a couple of new studios and a couple of new teams, you know, to, to create something on the independent circuit. But the real, the, the unfortunate situation and the unfortunate timing of the situation is that, you know, the Boston game development scene is is definitely shrinking. It is not growing. Like, mm-hmm. there is still a good, solid indie scene going on there. There are a lot of good developers that are, you know, making small projects there. Um, and there's Harmonix, and to a lesser degree, there's still Turbine, but they just, you know, laid off a bunch of people as well, so they're probably not hiring anytime soon. Uh, there just isn't, there aren't a lot of game jobs left in, in the greater New England area, and that means that a lot of those people are probably going to have to uproot their lives and, and, and take their, their stuff elsewhere unless they want to kind of form their own organization. So, you know, that's, that's really the, 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 that's the immediate impact is that, you know, as much as, you know, we can sit there and we can hope that a lot of good, interesting, you know, games come out of this situation, there is going to be a lot of upheaval before it gets to that point. And, you know, right, fortunately, again, the, the one thing the game industry does exceptionally well is rally behind people who have lost their jobs. Um, everywhere on social media, there are people linking to different uh, job docs and, and, and e- you know, email addresses of places to, to, to look for, for open positions. So, you know, the hope is that most of these people will land on their feet quickly, um, and those that don't, you know, I, 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 I just hope that, you know, something good comes out of this, because it, if it if this ends up being, you know, a long road for a lot of these people to, to find new work, like, it's just going to kind of leave a cloud over the whole situation that never quite goes away. And, and I guess, you know, as we start to, to wind this down, yeah. um, the thing I think about now is, you know, Bioshock Infinite, uh, slightly, uh, slightly spoilery, like, is sort of a meta-commentary on, like, the Bioshock franchise uh, in, yeah. in a certain way, uh, and the way it kind of ties everything together. Um, it makes me intensely curious about how Burial at Sea wraps up. Yeah. Um, and will Burial at Sea Part 2 in some ways be another meta-commentary on what's happening here? Because I doubt while this may be uh, new news to folks at the studio, potentially, and it's new news to us, uh, you know, I suspect it was not new news to Ken Levine, uh, no. and that, you know, he was working out how this was going to come together. Uh, so, given that, I wonder if there is anything that can be read into Burial at Sea, or if it will be just, you know, very purely a conclusion to uh, that chapter of his life. But you, you can't imagine he wasn't writing that and thinking about all of this stuff at the same time, uh, and while you know it's probably very easy to read too much into it, uh, I have to imagine I'm way more curious now than I was before. Yeah, yeah, and you know we'll we'll find out come March 25th, which I guess will be you know the the last release of anything with Irrational Games on it, as far as we know it. Um, 
I guess there are still people who will be working on that, you know, until it's up and out. But uh, you know, come once that thing is done, like that studio is is gone. And that's just you know, it, it's some people in the chat were talking about like, why are we talking about this? Why is this a big deal? You know, why are we making this into a big thing? And I would say. The reason is because this is a studio that has made some very prominent games. You know, it, it is, was field headed up by you know someone who was one of the more prominent names in game development. And seeing like situations like this just don't happen very often. You get layoffs because of you know uh, financial reasons or whatever else, but you don't have situations where a, a, a creatively just says, "Nope, I'm done here. I'm going to make a new thing." And the whole thing, the whole enterprise that had, you know, sort of birthed this this major franchise is, is kind of no more. So it's, you know, it th that doesn't happen very often. And this is kind of an insane thing to sort of uh, try and parse out because you don't think of a, a developer that makes these hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, kind of franchises just kind of suddenly not existing anymore. Yeah, and you know, depending on how this was handled uh, by yeah. Take Two, how this was handled by Ken Levine, uh, this may not be the last we hear about this uh, if it was uh, you know, handled in a manner that ends up creating a lot of uh, disgruntled folks. You know, right. Famously, um, you know, reports out of Irrational in the past have been that, uh, and I have heard this firsthand myself, uh, that Ken isn't the easiest guy to work with. Um, yeah. And uh, so, you know, how, how this how this gets handled, how people get transitioned, you know, in the, the letter it does mention that there are going to be sort of you know, uh, career days are, is the wrong term, but they're going to, you know, the other studios within Take-Two are going to come through and talk to the other members of uh, Irrational that are not coming along with Ken to uh, his new little incubator uh, to talk about potential opportunities for them, and then you've got the stuff that's happening today, but yeah, you know, I mean, it's hard to imagine that things like this don't happen and leave some people feeling awfully burned, and yeah. what the consequences are of that uh, I don't know. Uh, often, as is the case in video games, people tend to stay pretty quiet about it uh, because uh, the video game industry uh, is pretty incestuous in that mm -hmm. way, and uh, you don't want to burn bridges. But you know, I think uh, just like everyone else, I'll be anxious to hear if anything else comes out in the future. Yeah, keep an eye on uh, you know NeoGaf and Reddit this week to see if any uh, <laughs> anonymous developers pop up, you know, looking to, to talk a little shit because that 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 seems like something that very very realistically could happen. Yeah, unfortunately, in 2014, uh, a website like uh, Fat Babies does not exist anymore. Nope. Uh, if if most folks in the chat probably don't remember what Fat Babies was, but it used to be essentially uh, internet gossip uh, for the video game industry uh, and a sort of a sounding off board for a lot of folks uh, before we had uh, sort of a lot of ways to do that on, yeah. on the modern internet. But uh, in any case... Uh, I think we're going to wind this down because yeah. I think we've sort of exhausted all we can really say so far. But it's funny, uh, doing exactly what you and I are doing right now, Alex, is something I, I pitched when I first interviewed with Giant Bomb uh, when I was being looked at as more of a pure just news guy for right. the site, uh, was the idea of trying to do these impromptu uh, sort of discussions about stuff that don't, doesn't come up in the podcast. Um, and even though this will come up in the Bombcast next week, and uh, you know we'll, we'll certainly we'll revisit a little bit on, Friday, on the morning probably. show on Friday, uh, the idea of sort of kind of just jumping in uh, while everything is fresh, uh, I think, is a lot of fun. So if folks like this, uh, make sure and let us know, because uh, I'd certainly like to do uh, more of it in the future if uh, if people are game. Uh, but uh, I guess we're gonna leave it there. And uh, yeah. Alex, I will I will talk to you on Friday. Yeah, stay tuned to the site. If there's more on this story, we'll we'll certainly bring it to you. But until then, we'll talk Friday. All right. See you, man. Later.